All right. Uh, being 5.30, we'll call to order the meeting of the Fitchburg Board of Public Works for Monday, July 17th, held here at City Hall in the Francis Huntley Cooper Council Chambers. Uh, attending tonight, uh, myself, Chair, we have Don, Kim, and Bill, um, members, and Dave Wilborn is off with excuse. Uh, public appearances for non-agenda items, I don't believe we have any. So that takes us to the 3A approval of minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the June 22nd meeting minutes? I move approval. Moved by Jetser. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Gutowski. Any questions, clarifications, changes? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All in favor of the approval of the minutes, signify by saying aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Next is four report from the department, uh, city engineer and director of public works, Mr. Tim Volker. Thank you. I'll um, start with some staffing updates. The project engineer right away uh, position, uh, Zach started on Monday, July 10th. Uh, so Ross has officially moved over to the transportation engineer. So our transportation section is fully staffed and um, the utilities engineer, Tracy's old position, and the environmental engineering technician position still remain open. And then next up, just some project updates. The uh, Syene Road reconstruction project, uh, the intersection of Syene Road and, and Lacey remains closed. The last remaining utility was relocated on Sunday so that the contractor was able to resume work uh, first thing this morning. Uh, we anticipate that intersection reopening mid-August. So when that intersection opens in mid-August, the intersection of Syene and Cheryl will be closed down and that work will take place in September. For the Lacey Road Seminole Highway reconstruction project, MG&E, Charter, AT&T uh, worked on relocation of their facilities. Uh, the contractor continued to install water main and sewer as part of that project. And then back on June 28th, there was a public involvement meeting uh, with residents of the uh, Stoner Prairie neighborhood due to some uh, traffic uh, concerns that they had with the uh, road closure. So the uh, police department and Ross from Public Works uh, attended that meeting to kind of address the traffic concerns they had with the detour being um, you know, routed through their neighborhood. Uh, next up is our street resurfacing project. We received bids and are currently reviewing the, the bids. So in the, one of the upcoming meetings, you'll see a uh, contract to award that, that project. And then our Fitchrona Road reconstruction project. Uh, we continue working on the design of that project. And lastly, our Cheryl Drive stormwater improvements project. Uh, we're substantially complete, and the contractors uh, addressing some punch, minor punch list items that they have. Uh, with that, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for, for the report, Tim. You're welcome. Uh, next, we'll move into our agenda items. <clears throat> First one is Resolution R-131. Uh, 23, granting public, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, agenda item 5A, review of utility P card purchases and checks. I did have a question. All right, so I'll open up the bo board members. Any questions on the, on the P card purchases and, and checks? I had one. I had Bill. Um, there's an $87,000 check for Madison Sewer District connections. I'm just curious as to what connections those are. Uh, check 125267 if you want to hit control F. 125267. Yep. So I, I'll take a shot at uh, Tim will correct me, but I, I believe that's our, you know, when we have new <clears throat> areas that are developed and that's uh, a connection fee into the sanitary sewer for, the, uh, for that capacity from those residents. Am I correct? I was just wondering which ones those were. I've, oh, I, I see. You knew that. You just well, I'm pretending one. I knew that now that you've said it. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I don't know what area. I mean. Tim, could you? 
put a note on that to get back to the board? Yeah, I can s send a follow-up email regarding the specific location for those connections. Might be multiple locations. I, I don't know. Yeah. Give me one sec. I, any, other, any other ones? Here? I, uh, just out of general curiosity, because we've got about almost $3,000 worth of chemicals. Do you know what those are? Yes, that would be our the chlorine for the for the water, um, and then also fluoride we treat. Thank you. Is that would be would that be for a, a one of the wells for a quarter of the year or uh, just for? I, no, I believe the delivery happens for all the wells at, at okay. the same time, and then I. I believe it happens more frequently than quarterly. Okay. I think we have them almost every month on yeah, these. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Do you monitor the P card things like, you know, by category from quarter to quarter or year to year to see if you're but if you're pretty close to what you thought you you know, what you have spent in the past or if there's been anything unusual? Yeah, so the there's a review process for the P cards. It, it goes through, you know, the supervisor will enter it into the system. It gets sent to me for review. So I'll be able to, I, you know, review every receipt, um, check it against the budget. If I have a question, I'll call the supervisor. Um, and then as far as expenditures, yeah, we, we can pull reports and, and look at that to see how we're tracking. Um, we're in budget right now, so that's what we're looking at is, hey, you know, halfway through the year, are we, you know, behind or do we need more money for next year's budget in this area and less money in this area? So, yeah, we're constantly mo monitoring that. So if they've already charged something on a P card, do you, so do you get those receipts after they do that? And if you have a question and it's something that's incorrect, how does it get corrected? Uh, we would, you know, if it's a vendor error, we go back to the vendor and, and get it rectified. Um, you know, if it's something internally that wasn't supposed to be bought, you know, we'd have to deal with that. I haven't run into that yet, okay. um, but that's something we would address with the, the employer, the supervisor, on, you know, if it wasn't supposed to be bought with the P card, we would address it at that time. I suppose, and then at that time, we'd probably see a negative on here because it was already charged and then a reversal or whatever. Yeah, correct. Okay. Like sometimes what will happen because the uh, city's tax exempt, um, a vendor may or a store will charge taxes and, you know, they won't notice that till they get back to the shop or something like that. So we'll have to go back to the vendor and have them issue a refund for the, the taxes that were issued. Any other? I, I just had one. Uh, 523 check 125281 water well solutions, well five maintenance services for 77644 Is that maybe the final one? Final one? Or... I know a, a change order recently was put in for water well, and that was for the, the VFD that we're looking to have installed for that well. Um, so that, that will be the, the final one. Okay. But I believe the 77000 was all the work uh, up until Prior to that. Change. Okay. Correct. What are you, uh, since you opened the door, what, uh, will, will, the, will the VFD, will that, uh, is that a starting, uh, starting thing, reduce um, voltage dip on s starting, or does it allow the, uh, the well to, to run more efficiently? Yes, it's a, the variable frequency drive for the, the well, so we'll be able to operate it depending on the demand the well's seeing, um, so it is more energy efficient. Same, same uh, motor, it's just on the front end. Correct. Uh, we're not changing the motor, okay. Any other questions on that? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Tim. We'll move on to uh, agenda item 6A, resolution R131-23, granting public utility easements in lot 35 of Terra Vesa. Do we have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. By Kim, do we have a second? Second. Second by Don. Um, I noticed on this one it, uh, that it's non-compensable. Now, most of the time when the, um, 
know, this is a new this is a new um, new subdivision, and normally they put in their um, have it laid out that the easements you know are at the back lot lines and things like that. Uh, what's what created this uh, this need? This one. And I was kind of going to get into that in my explanation. Uh, we're looking for the motion to also include a um, revision to strike through that and not have it be non-compensable. So just to remove that language from the resolution exactly for that reason. Typically the plat shows it um, being compensable, um, you know, because the easements follow the lot lines and all, all that. All right, so let me get to the uh, let me get to the the motion where that is, and I'll make page eleven. Page 11. Okay, thank you, Bill. So twelve is the actual resolution. Okay. So it's the fourth whereas. One, two, three, four. Okay, so I'll. Move to amend this resolution to delete uh, clause four, whereas this easement is non compensable. I'll second that. Second by Kim. Any discussion? Do we do we want to remove that altogether or just remove the non dash? Uh, typically remove that just have it removed. Okay. That's unambiguous? Yes. Okay. No questions will call the vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, so we have an amendment to our to our initial resolution. So um, what was different about this, I, I guess? So, so this is for the third edition to the Terra Vesa plat. Um, and the third edition was approved by the city by resolution R-21-23. Um, and this easement is being implemented in order to avoid additional utility crossings in the right of way. Uh, so we're looking for a public utility easement, you know, telephone, cable, gas, electric, um, across outlot 35 in Terra Vesa, um, and this will service the, the third addition to the Terra Vesa plat. So I think this, it kind of happened on the border between the second and third edition. So it kind of got missed. Otherwise you would have seen this in the plat. As Dave was mentioning, typically these are compensable when they're included with the plat. So therefore we're looking to have this added along the, the right of way line, a 10 foot wide easement for any public utility. Questions on this? Is there anything planned for Outlaw 35 that we know of? Uh, not as of right now. So this, having this re will reduce other, need to cross other right away? In, uh, Correct. It, yeah. it avoids us going or having them go into the, the public right away. Okay. No further questions. We'll call the vote. All in favor of the amended resolution R-131-23 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we're on to uh, 6 uh, Bravo. Uh, resolution R-133-23 authorizing rejection of the bid for City Hall front desk remodel. The motion to approve. I'll move to approve. Moved by Kim. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Bill. Um, so we went out for bids on this, and we received one bid from Tri North, who not the typical type of firm that I think would would do a project like like this. And, and uh, the the price price reflected that that they were uh, you know above our above our threshold. So we are going to reject this. And um, I'll let you, what, what's, what's our plan moving forward, I guess? So we're looking to have this bid rejected. It was $87,000 over the engineer's estimate. Um, and we're looking to rebid the project later this year, you know, hoping that there's some more interest once it gets colder and people want to stay indoors and not outdoors uh, with construction. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the plan. 
You, you don't have any plans to make any changes to the plans? So you're not redesigning it or taking anything out or doing anything different? No, so that the city hall front desk um, is in need of remodel and kind of what was implemented as, as part of that project was to address some security and operational issues. So if we do remove that, we would you know, not be able to address either the security or the operational issues that we're f foreseeing. Um, you know, that's something we could look at if it were not successful again uh, a second time. I think that would be then the next alternative to, to look into. So, so right now you're thinking it's more of a timing thing and people are busy and just didn't take the time to look at it and do it and... Yeah, yeah I think it's a, you know, such a small, a it's a project. small project yeah. and everyone's so busy that they don't, you know, by the time they put up a bond and all the, the stuff the city requires for such a small project, it, it's more work than, um, more work to get a smaller project when they're busy um, with other items. What's the bond requirement on? We, it's the, co the cost of the, the project, so, and then they place a, the bid bond too on top of that and then insurance requirements listing the city as additionally insured um, I was wondering if there's you know that that our, our advertisement if there's a different demographic you know whether it's home remodel you know uh, commercial commercial remodelers versus you know a large construction management firm like Tri North you know that manages schools and hospitals and things like that that different uh, different group uh, and that's something maybe we could discuss prior to going out to bid the second time with the building department maybe find this local smaller contractor versus a, a bigger larger commercial like Findor for Tri North yeah, might be the the option you might with. find a smaller one or have them ask was there something in the you know, the insurance requirements or the bid bond or something that made them not bid it the first time where that would be a relatively easy fix rather than changing the design as long as it was agreeable to the city and the city attorney. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I think we go down that route. I, I, I don't know if you get much better bid from, from the big guys. Uh, they're, they're geared up to do, you know, half million dollar projects or small ones for them. Um, all right, any other questions? Okay. All in favor of resolution R-133-23, authorizing rejection of bid for City Hall front desk remodel, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next we have re resolution R-120-23, accepting the 2022 Compliance Maintenance Annual Report for the Wastewater Collection System for the city of Fitchburg, Wisconsin. We have a motion to approve. I'll move approval. Moved by Bill. We have a second. Second. Second by Don. So this is an annual, you know, an annual report, and our our collection system, our maintenance, wastewater. We do not have a, um, a treatment plant as as some cities do. So our our system is a, is a little little simpler, and then from a um, we only have two two pumping stations here, one that we inherited and one that one that got kind of thrust on us in uh, Terra Vesta, so we show some energy energy usage um, in there and future you know we have to we have to set aside money for future maintenance or replacement. Uh, is there anything else noteworthy in there, or does the board have questions on this? I had a couple of Go questions, ahead, mostly out of curiosity. Um, I guess first, though, you said we've got two. The report says we've just got one. Well, we have Terravesa, and um, you know, you're you're right, Bill. We we pay the cost. City of Madison. Uh, we split the cost, but I think City of Madison operates the one in uh, in Southtown. In yeah. Southtown, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. I was, I was saying we. We have two on our system, but we only operate one, and that's the one in Terravesa. Again, our um, another thing I'd like to point out on here, you know, one of the one of the things on a, a system like this is um, if it's maintained that we're not getting large amounts of groundwater infiltration into our to our system, which then we have to pay for. Uh, you know, we're paid by a volume. 
volume as it goes into Madison Met. And so you know, we monitor that by looking at our pumping rates versus you know, what, we're, uh, what we're billed for, and, and hopefully that would point out um, if we have an area that is um, a lot of infiltration going in there, and then we'd have the option to line it. And the other, the other thing that we look for that is uh, our 10-year inspection. Would that, would you see that in a 10-year inspection if we were getting substantial water infiltration? Yeah, and also TVing the the sewer too. You can see the condition of the pipes if the joints aren't are coming apart, crack, roots growing in. Um, so that'd be able to uh, also be another method to oh, to was, seeing yeah. the condition of the system. For no, you know, Fitchburg celebrated, um, or tomorrow, tomorrow they're at the Key Farms Park, or tonight. Day, I think. Is it tonight? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess next yeah, next stop on my bike, sure. next stop on my bike, uh, our 40 year anniversary. So you know, we have pipe that's been in the ground. You know, we were uh, there were things in the ground, you know, before we became a city. But uh, you know, we're, we're we have some we have facilities, you know, kind of at 40. 40 years and kind of my, my threshold when you start hitting 50, you can run into problems and, and hopefully we don't have to reconstruct too many things, you know, that the lining would take care of that. But those are things that could be coming up in the future. Uh, Tim, any other, any other comments? Or Bill, I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I, I, there's, there's gas usage at the pumping station. I'm just wondering what that's for. Even like June, July, and August, there's eight therms worth of gas per month. What, what is that for? Where do you see that in the right, annual a, report? Yeah. Column there that shows. Page 19 yeah. of the packet. Yeah. It's got the electricity and the natural gas. Yeah. We're typically heating our buildings, I, I think, with natural gas or, or wells and things. But um, I've never been in that pumping station, Bill, so I'm... Yeah, that, I mean, that building would be heated. The, the wells wouldn't be included in this since this yeah. is just for wastewater. Um, so I, I can follow up with you on that, but I believe it's for the Terravesa pump station because it, it's a, a yeah, building. I, I guess I just, I wouldn't expect any gas usage in June, July, and August. Other than that, um, I noticed that the, the financial management section has a total of 120 points you can lose, uh, but the score is based on 100, and that section was not filled out in there. So uh, page 20 of the packet. The section, you know, total points generated and your score in the section grade that's not filled out. I see it is on 24, so I don't know. One might be the financial and the other may be the, the condition of the system. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll follow up with Tracy on, on that to make sure before we submit to the DNR that it gets addressed. And then the grading summary at the end on page 25. Uh, it's got the sections for financial and collection. It, the financial row is not filled out. Yeah, and that's what I believe that, that first right. part is. Yep. So, And to go back to the natural gas, I, I think the generator is on natural oh. gas. It's not diesel. Oh, so that's I'm why, sorry. you know, to Starts. test it, it needs to be tested every so often. So that's why you're run. seeing a small usage in June and July. They probably run it for... Might run it for a half hour. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I was curious. Um, and the last thing, um, uh, tell us what televising means in the in, in the context of, of this lift station in the, and the 95 miles of sewer pipes we've got. It means putting a camera into the pipe and, and videotaping it. So it's nice. like a robotic uh, televisor. You know, there's... Um, with wheels and remote control from the road uh, where they're monitoring it on a TV and driving it through the pipe. You know, if they see something, they'll stop it, kind of do a full rotation, note, you know, any um, 
cracks, joints that aren't um, together, you know, any roots growing into the system. And then there's, they'll provide us a video of that where we can watch it, rewind, fast forward, look at it. And, you know, that's how we kind of go about addressing any issues in the pipe without having to excavate it. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. We do that a lot before you do the road construction, just because if something oh. is wrong, you'd want to get it fixed before you rebuild the whole road and then have six months later a pipe burst or something. I have a question on um, item number three, replacement funds. You know, do you say equipment replacement funds. When, when was the equipment replacement fund last reviewed or revised? And you have a year in there, but then you say it's not applicable because you don't have equipment replacement fund. So I was sort of surprised there was a year in there when it's not applicable. Yeah, it's page 17, item number three. Yeah, and that may have been inadvertently checked. It, I would think one to two years ago, because we do replace the, the trucks in the explanation. Yeah, you say the utility purchases equipment, equipment through, budgeting, through budgeting, so rather than a funder. I don't know. It just seemed, okay. it seemed weird to me that it said NA, and then there was a year in there. Um, if you back up to Section 2.3, it says... Did you have a special account, you know, for example, a segregated replacement fund or financial resources available for repairing or replacing equipment? So maybe that's, you know, it's the or part of that that we're responding to here. If it's through budgeting, you know, I can see it's, but it's not a re equipment replacement fund. So I don't know, that just confused me when I looked through it. Yeah, I'll have to check with Tracy and maybe kind of the financial term, the equipment replacement fund, maybe that's not what we call it or not what finance considers it. So she may have checked the NA because of that and forgot to remove the 2022. I, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll double check with her on that and we'll get that cleaned up prior to submitting. As long as we're talking about this specific section here, um, is, is there equipment other than trucks? It says IE trucks rather than EG. Um, and I didn't know if that was intentional or just a mistake. Yeah, it, it's other equipment. Um, you know, we have a vac truck, so that would be included our utility pickup trucks. Um, and then any, you know, generators would be included in the, the small equipment and any, not so much as tools like shovels or anything, we don't have a replacement fund for that. Um, but yes, it is for other, other equipment, large value. Any, any other questions? Um, does the, go ahead, Bill. Or Don. Does the grade help us in any way for grants or anything? Or is it just if you get below a C, you've got to just report a whole lot more? Yeah, but with um, getting below a C or less um, is basically, I, I think you have to come up with an action response plan and to address those items that, that are rated below a C. And recommend, so it, it would be the third whereas clause. It is necessary to provide recommendations or an action response plan for all individual CMAR section grades of C or less and or an overall grade point average less than three. So our, our system was graded at an A for collection and an A for finance. So our overall GPA was a 4.0. Are we, are we grading ourselves? Yes. Yeah, anytime there was a yes, no on there, if you selected no, it told you how many points to subtract. And this, this discusses, you know, the capacity management operation and maintenance. On the capacity management side, uh, how do you, 
how do you account for that? You know, say we're putting in a new subdivision and it's going into an uh, existing uh, interceptor and it goes into, you know, where, where is that in the design, in your design process, you know, our, our capacity planning for, for, you know, I understand the water fairly well, but. So that, I, obviously, the, the earlier you can look at that, the, the better. So before design starts, you want to have that answered to see what existing infrastructure can handle. So, you know, we look at what's all tied into the system currently, um, what the flows are, and then obviously look at the flows of the uh, development that's c coming online to see if that... The larger pipes needed and upsizing, or if the current system can can handle that capacity. I'd be correct, you know, say in our uh, in our planning, we have a we have an area, say it's 200 acres, and it's zoned a certain, you know, say it's certain density, residential or commercial, whatever. That if we um, we're sizing a sanitary sewer, say it's an interceptor, we're sizing it. Based on that and the other developable land in that in that area, so that we don't get caught having to, you know, you have it in. Now, oh, it's not big enough for the additional things that would be gravity fed into that into that area. Am I am I somewhat close there? Yes. Okay. It probably most of the problems occur when you, like you said, they base it on what the zoning is. If the zoning changes, changes and, you right. and you go from single family residential to high density apartments or something like that, you know, that wasn't originally planned. That's where a lot of the questions come in. But usually it, that's exactly what it is. All the vacant land is whatever it's zoned for. They take that into account when they size the interceptors. Any, any other questions on one there? final one, Tim? Um, it, you're going to go through with cameras on the system as part of your proposal here. Do you have the entire system aged? I mean, there's a lot of new stuff that's not going to go bad for a while, but there's probably a lot of existing stuff that. Yeah, that, we don't do the entire system every year. It's a certain percentage. Obviously, we place a precedence on the older infrastructure, making sure we have a handle on that. Um, and we ne wouldn't necessarily televise, you know, a brand new system like Terravesa, right? You know, because it's two, three years into the ground. Um, but you know, prior to accepting it, we we get a televising reports from the developer or contractor review that prior to it accepting the infrastructure to make sure that it is indeed acceptable. Um, who do we typically hire to do the televising for us? It seems like it's been the same firm for a while. Yeah, I th and I think there's several companies out there that, that do it, three or four. Um, the specific names I'm not familiar with, but I, I do know that the city's used a couple um, recently. Okay. Any other questions on that? So now we'll call them. Go I, ahead, Bill. Yeah, so uh, on the very last thing here about energy efficiency, there's mention of, you know, a solar feasibility study. Um, and I, I noticed that the uh, lift station out in Terra Vesa, the roof line goes, is, is oriented north-south. And if it were east-west, then you'd have a nice flat roof facing south to accept solar panels. I'm just wondering, what is it? what thought goes into the orientation of that building? That one I'm not specifically... Yeah, predated it, it, It's been designed, it was designed and built prior to me, so what went into that thought process, I, I, I don't know. I, I do know Tracy is undertaking the, the solar study right now with, with Strand, they're looking at that, um, especially with the new well we're looking to have come online and, and that building to, to see the feasibility of solar for that, whether it's roof mounted or, or ground mounted is, is something else that they're looking into. So there's not some general rule of thumb that says all the buildings should face one way or the other i believe south is you want the panels facing south because no i mean just in general if you're if you're putting up a municipal building something like this is there is there any reason that you might orient it north south versus east west versus somewhere in between 
I mean, there, there's a lot of variables that can play into that. You know, not not just solar. It's you know access right. for our staff and what the building's for, what we need to get in. Um, if, if equipment breaks, you know, how do we get the pump out with a crane? Um, so yes, solar may be best facing south. However, us to get the well pump out because it, it broke it is a little more important. So we may not be able to meet that the solar part of it due to us being needing to meet the operational feasibility of the building. Yeah, I, I, I just didn't know if there was, you know, like by default, it's probably best to orient it a particular way. I didn't know if there was such a thing like that. No. Every situation's di different depending on what it. Yeah. Any other questions? Call the vote. All in favor of resolution R1 2023 accepting 2022 compliance maintenance annual report for wastewater collection systems signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have ordinance 2023 0 14. Amending chapter 30 to allow construction of private wells on agricultural lands adjacent to municipal water main and amending the terms of chapter 40 for compulsory water connection waivers. We have a motion to approve. I'll move. Moved by Bill, I'll sec second, second by Kim. Um, so this is relatively self explanatory, you know, that we. Uh, Ordinance is set up initially here, you know, once the once uh, uh, city water goes by, you know, if you have an existing well, you can keep it, but uh, new ones aren't allowed, you know, for home use. So this is set up, as, as Tim explains, and is, uh, you know, using municipal water, you know, pulled from 400 feet down and chlorinated and fluorinated isn't necessarily the best use for both agricultural uh, if you're, if you're watering crops or watering animals. And so I, I believe this sets up six conditions, I, I believe, in there that would allow this to, would allow someone to to uh, have, the, have the private well. Um, so I, what else you want to add on this, Tim? I think you, you said it great uh, it's private well to be drilled on agricultural land located within 200 feet of a municipal water main um, so it'd be allowed for irrigating agricultural land crop production and livestock purposes uh, the changes prohibit the use of the well for you know human consumption okay question um do we know what type of well? I mean, if it's a high capacity well, is it gonna get the city well run and dry? Or the the well type that it's dependent on the ag agricultural land, and then it would be approved by the by Dane County, you know, so they would have to get the the well permit for that and the well operation permit. So they're probably not going to. Um they're not going to drill as, as far down as we would. You know, we're down on the Mount Simon. Um, yeah, they'd be in the aquifer above us. Yeah. Now, that's what the county, that'd be the county's, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, it'd be the county's um, responsibility for uh, proving that, approving that well and, and looking at there's other other residential wells around there concerning whether you would be sucking them dry or is how Correct. that process play out. Okay. okay. All right. Um, I guess, uh, um, uh, Anila, would you like to say anything on this? Like to so what you're here for, isn't it? Or are you here for six? You're here for six. You're here for this one, aren't you? I said, uh, it's, uh, is it Anila? Angela. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, Angela, would you like to s speak on this at all? Sure. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I didn't really prepare anything. I'll 
Um, yeah, I'm the um, executive director with Groundswell Conservancy, and this is a property that we own and that is leased by a black farmer, Robert Pierce, of Neighborhood Food Solutions. Um, it's about 35 acres, as you probably know. Um, he's been using um, municipal water, which isn't um, basically a good permanent solution for him. Um, he's been using kind of a watering can method of watering his crops, which um, is not really adequate. Um, we had applied for um, a waiver for a well back in 2021, and um, you know, over the course of that period, he's been using this very inadequate system. And we're really excited and um, about the um, the idea of being able to have this ordinance change put into place so that we can actually give him a chance for success um, and this property a chance for success. It's an equitable access to land program. Um, that is um, going to be really beneficial to BIPOC farmers and the, the Fitchburg community. So, um, so I'm really excited to be here, um, and I'm uh, hoping that this um, ordinance change passes. So, um, but if anyone has any questions, I am not an engineer. I would have to go back to my staff to uh, get specifics. But, um, but I believe that this is a really good, um, good, uh, good step in the right direction for the city of Fitchburg and for our organization. Uh, I'm just going to ask you this. Has, has, he, has anyone priced out what the price cost of a well, well like that is? You know, my, well, I realize, you know, you don't necessarily want to use city water. I, I think in the long run, it's a lot cheaper than having your own well. Um, well, um, you know, municipal water hookup, if we were to do a municipal water hookup, hook it's, yeah. it would be really expensive. It, we'd price it up between 70000 and 100000 on um, the last time we got a quote, and that was a while back. Um, so a well would be considerably less expensive for us. Not cheap by any means, but considerably less expensive. So so for not-for-profits, we both are not-for-profits. Um, Neighborhood Food Solution and our organization, um, you know, we're looking to, you know, we, we've gotten support from some sponsors to, you know, um, pay for the well, but it, it's not, not enough. So we rely on private individuals to help support um, that purchase of the of the well. Um, if it, we had that hook up, the hookup to municipal water it would cost a lot more, and we don't have the money for that. Okay. So I don't know where seventy thousand seems high, but uh, maybe it's a longer maybe it's a longer run. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep, thank, thank you. All right. Jim? This is just a, a change in the whole general ordinance. Maybe this maybe this brought it up to light to. Um, but it's not specifically for this one development. It would change it citywide, correct? Correct. Yeah, I mean, it seems to make a lot more sense because if it's non-potable water um, and you're using it for irrigation, I guess whoever it is, it's not saying they have to do it, but that they would be allowed to, I guess, if they did their own cost-benefit analysis to, to determine which is the better option for them. And I, I do think it would be... Um, good for the city to allow them not to have to use city water and you know preserve that for what we needed it for and they wouldn't have to go that deep into that aquifer so i think it's a good idea Other board members comments yeah. thoughts yeah Bill? yeah it's some uh i'm reading the existing uh bullet points from the ordinance and i'm having trouble understanding which one of these uh tripped us up in the first place because you know it's not used to obtain or provide water for human consumption. Uh, you know, the municipal water is unsuitable, I think we can all probably agree, for agricultural uses. Um, it's not gonna impose an unreasonable, well, I mean, having to use it would impose an unreasonable hardship upon the property owner at 70 to $100,000. Uh, the well does not, I wouldn't think it's gonna pose any threat to the public good or to the health and safety and welfare of the city. And as long as they get a, a permit, um, everything should be in order. So, what what was the what was the problem with this? They were required. If there was a water line within 200 feet of the property, they were required to connect to the city water system. Unless each of these conditions is met. I think right? these are no. Uh, the no, these are the ones that were existing in the ordinances. What we're changing. Uh, it was a couple pages later, I think, right? 
on page 31. And, and, and I was a little confused on the changes as well, because this, you know, in section 30.67, it says the director of public works may authorize, but then in 40-90, it says uh, the owner shall be granted a, uh, a compulsory connection waiver. I'm just paging down, so. What what sec what is which sections amended here is what I'm I'm looking at the ordinance. Maybe maybe it's the second bullet. The water supply is unsuitable for the intended use of water obtained from the private municipal water supply is unsuitable. For the intended use of water obtained for the, I mean, it's nobody's saying municipal water is unsuitable for irrigation or for livestock. It would, I mean, it could be used for that. Obviously, it's been used for that in other cases. All our, all our community gardens are watered with <laughs> yeah. city water. Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe, it, is it that bullet item that is being changed? And if it's, Except if city water is acceptable for human consumption, why would it not be acceptable for livestock yeah, right. consumption? Yeah. Well, and I, I didn't do my homework, but I, I guess I, it wouldn't surprise me if dumping chlorine and fluoride onto the ground is not necessarily a good thing. I think it would evaporate. That's the only point that I can see that it yeah. you're saying you'd have to prove where it would be not where it would be unsuitable and it, I mean I don't you you can use water for irrigation everybody uses it for their lawns and things anyway so I think it's taking that clause that that one was hard to prove yep come on up come on yeah up. that was the that was the um, criterion. And um, there was no way for us to prove that you couldn't use municipal water on plants and um, vegetables. Um, it just didn't seem like a, a really good usage for a 35 acre farm um, zoned exclusive agriculture. So, um, but that was the, that was the criterion. Um, that was just, just pretty much impossible for us to improve. So, <laughs> so that's, so you're absolutely um, correct. Just, just out of curiosity, do you have any idea how many gallons w would they would go through in a dry week on 35 acres? I have no, I have no idea. I really don't. Um, Gardeners are, are told they should inch. give their guard, gardens an inch of water every week, and you know the the, the proposed changes um, say you know minimum size has to be 10 acres, and and that would be half of one of our small. Uh, water towers every week <laughs> you know, if you did an inch yeah the current user is, isn't using enti isn't using the entire property um, so so we really it would be really hard for us to gauge he's expanding as he goes um, with this program so so that's the plan but it's over time so we wouldn't have even have uh, really good records on that Any other questions on it? Okay. All right, seeing none, uh, we'll call the vote all in favor of, one sec here, I got Paige back up. Well, so. Go ahead, Bill, what, yeah, what's your thought here? Uh, I just, you know, the wording on there, again, it, it said, uh, you know, it's, it's basically at the discretion of the public works director, but then later on it says, 
that the owner shall be granted a, a waiver. And I didn't know how, the, how to reconcile those two statements. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Bill. Um, Tim, can we can we take this back? Where, where, what, where's the language you're referencing that states shall? What page? Um, it's on page 31. It's under section three. And then it's the fourth line down. Um, Exception as here and after provided, or except as here and after provided upon application by the owner to the board, lands zoned for agricultural use or for which a farmland preservation agreement has been recorded shall be granted a compulsory connection waiver. Right, and then the other section was section one above. Yes, the director of public works may authorize the construction and operation of a private well. And those are two different sections. One section 30.67 and then the other section 40-90. Correct. Maybe it's the Board of Public Works director to determine if he may grant it, but then it says it shall be granted if all of the waivers are met. And maybe that's where it's the may authorize it if he has to determine if he thinks all the waivers are met. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Who wrote the new language? I believe it was Tra Tracy from Public Works and then reviewed by the city attorney through the process. I don't like ambigu ambiguity in, in, in right. ordinances. It, it just leads to wailing and gnashing of teeth in the future. Um, can, we, can we clean it up so that ambiguity is removed? is what I would ask. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so I guess, should the wording in section 40-90 be may be granted rather than shall be granted? Or maybe there's larger context, because I didn't go back and read all of the codes surrounding, uh, you know, surrounding this. Maybe, maybe the context makes it clearer. Would lean towards that. Just remove the shell. Could may, and it just causes for discussion, and it's not a. Well, do we want to defer this until we can get clarification? I, I would. I would like clarification. Tracy? Yeah. Does it? But does that make a difference whether it's shell or may at this point? If you would review this and it said the word may, would you? Would it change your minds at all? No, but I'd rather not put ambiguous, I'd rather not approve it and put ambiguous language yeah. into the ordinances. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, get it, get it right before we put it in. I guess I'd say it's, it's sort of safe to say that we are generally in favor of this, but we want to make sure that the language is allowing you the opportunity to review it or the director of public works and you know, not that you are required to do it, but make sure that both sections in context with the rest of the ordinance is clear. Yeah. Or if, if, if we amend this to say may instead of shall and approve it, then it'll run up, where does it go from here? It'll eventually go before council. Are there any steps in between there, here and there? Yeah, it's going to plan commission on July 18th. Okay. And then also Ag and Rural Affairs on July 18th. And then previously it was at the Resource Conservation Commission last week, Monday. 
which I believe uh, approved it. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to change, uh, change ordinances, or, you know, myself, or the words, but you know, I'm, if the, if the board is inter if the board wants to go that route, change the shell to me, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You know, what's your preference, or would we rather send it, ask, ask them to take one more look at it and make sure, remove any ambiguity? Well, I'm, yeah, so I'm wondering maybe we should amend it, amend it to say May, and then it'll go, like you said, before okay. plan and ag affairs, and they will then be aware of the change we made, and that will trigger them to okay. look at it a little closer. I can live with that. All right, I'll move that we amend the proposed changes to say may be granted a compulsory connection waiver rather than shall be granted. Okay. We have a second to Alder Jetzer's motion. Second. Second by Don. Further discussion on the amendment. All right. Call the vote on uh, favor of the amendment to change the uh, shall to me. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Next on to the initial. Uh, I'll call the vote. All in favor of uh, amended ordinance 2023-0-14, uh, amending chapter 30. Signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. The ordinance, the amended ordinance, is, is approved. Right. And they make that note for the other committees to to look at that. Will do. Thank you, Bill, for that, that keen eye. I, I I despise ambiguity in our ordinances because it, I've been beat over the head with it many times in the past. You could have, you could have a uh, a discrepancy between two parties, and each one can argue that. Their particular ordinance <coughs> is in their favor. Yep. All right, next we'll move on to 6 Echo Resolution R14023, approving municipal agreement for carbon reduction program. Do we have a motion to approve? I move approval. Moved by Bill. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Kim. So we're, uh, uh, our proposal is to change out 151 uh, light fixtures with a uh, LED using lower, was it 155? 105. 105, okay, thank you. 105 um, to an LED providing a better light at lower energy. Uh, the, the, um, it outlines that they were applying for an 80% federal grant for this, and the city would be responsible for the other 20% of the purchase. Okay. First, do we have a motion to approve this resolution? Sorry. I think we did. Oh, did we? Yes. Okay, Bill. Yeah, we're discussing it. All right. So, uh, uh, Tim, what would you like to add to this? Uh, so, the city had applied for and received grant funding um, from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation uh, through the carbon reduction uh, program. Uh, the state's providing 80% of the, the funding uh, for construction costs up to 67000 $822, so the remaining 20% would be uh, City of Fitchburg funded, uh, which is approximately $17,018. And we're looking for approval of the state municipal agreement here for conversion of the approximately 105 uh, streetlight fixtures. And I guess to kind of go into um, kind of the, the wattage too, Alder Herbs, you had uh, sent a, an email. Um, so approximately 94 of those lights are 100 watts, 10 are 150 watts, and one is 175 watts. So six of those 105 are mercury vapor light bulbs, and then 99 are high pressure sodium. So we're looking to replace those with um, LED. And we're not replacing them with the same wattage, um, but rather the equivalent brightness. And then there's a couple areas that have some safety concerns. So th those would be replaced with a, a brighter light installed in, in those areas. And then some of these lights are metered and then others are not metered. Um, but however, when we get switched over to the more energy efficient bulbs, um, we would get a, a discount for that from MG&E. Okay. 
So, so I'll make sure we can capture. And then lastly, MG&E would perform this work for us. Uh, we had budgeted an amount of $100 per fixture for them to, to do that for us. Okay. So the, there'd be an additional um, 10500 for for installation? Correct. Okay, so it'd be... Um, so that's not we're, that's not reflected in this uh, in this resolution. It's just the resolution is just uh, the purchase of this equipment. Correct. It's the fixture and, and the bulbs, not the the install, since the okay. installation is not covered by the grant. And what um, what budget item? Where where do we? Uh, what budget category are we using to pay MG&E the ten thousand? Uh, I believe the the CIP project for this had included uh, locally fund local funds for that, and then also if that's not sufficient or the costs come in higher than what we budgeted, Mark has some money in his operations for light fixtures that he he has rolled from 2022 into this year okay. that we could utilize okay. that he hasn't expensed yet. Okay. So this is a this is a state grant, and I'm assuming it would be the money the state is giving is coming from the gas tax, the state gas tax. Uh, it's from the DOT. Would that would that make sense? I, I don't know where the the funding source is on the okay. state state side for this. Okay, but this is this is coming from the state. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you probably have some well, yeah, I was going to say, we've done this in several different communities right now. We're doing it for all of the city of West Dallas, for all of their light fixtures. Um, we've done some, the, all the research work and applied for the grants, and, um, and we've done it for West Bend. We've done it for several different communities, and they're saving a lot of money by going from, especially the high-pressure sodium, to the LED lights. It's very common. All, communities all over are looking at it, so you're probably best to get in before the money is gone on it. But it's it's pretty common. Almost every community is doing it. It's their their better lights. Um, you know, in terms of quality of lighting the area and it's a lot more energy efficient. Thank you, Ken. Any other questions on this? Yeah. Go ahead, Go ahead Bill. Uh, a Go couple ahead. questions. So we're doing 105. What what's the like the overall? How many how many total lights do we have? How many are currently LED? Why did we choose 105? So that there was a map included in, in the right agenda packet on the areas that that are being replaced. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't have that. Andrew was the one that had applied for this, I believe, two years ago. We weren't successful in getting the funding last year. Um, so we had to fill out paperwork this year to re-enroll, and we were uh, successful for that. So uh, I don't know the reasoning or logic on why these areas were. I just had filled out the one page to, to renew our original application to try to get the, the funding for this year. I believe there's a, there's a maximum amount of money that you can get, so you can sort of okay. back into how many light fixtures that would replace, and then you prioritize what areas in the city um, that are backing into the maximum amount of the grant, and you know, at 80%, what would be the total project cost, and then you look at what it costs, and then back into how many fixtures you could replace, and then which ones are the best ones to be replaced first or with this program. Okay, the same process we use for the bus shelters essentially, yeah. yeah. Don? I'm not familiar with Grant. It sounds like you know, because I do know there's a lot of communities that are going 100% LED. Uh, I assume they were doing it all based on grants, but maybe not. Does that prohibit Tim from applying again for the rest of them? I think you can apply again. I know a lot of communities are doing it and paying it with their own budgets because of, of how much money they would save with their electricity costs. Really highly urban areas like West Dallas is one of the ones that we're doing. And they have a lot of street lights. whereas in Fitchburg, you know, there's a lot of rural areas that it isn't as intense as that. But I do believe that after you go through this, it doesn't preclude you from applying again if the program is still out there. Good discussion. Any other questions? 
Yeah. Um, well. What do we know about the state of these LED lights? Um, there's an awful lot of them in recent years uh, that you know lose their fluorescent coating and then they turn purple. Has that issue been resolved? This was like you know the manufacturer's subcontractor or whatever, and pretty much every manufacturer was using the same <laughs> the same light bulbs. Uh, I'm haven't heard of any issues that we've had with I know Mark's replaced some you know as the high pressure sodium goes out he'll go in and replace it with LEDs uh, I haven't heard of any issues that he's having with that um, I don't know how long he's been doing that if, if it's just you know a year and it takes seven years to, to get there or, or whatnot but I, I haven't heard anything any other questions Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All in favor of Resolution R-140-23, approving municipal agreement for carbon reduction program, signified by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Next, we have Resolution 6, Foxtrot. R-146-23, approving the collateral assignment of agreement for subdivision improvements to the third addition to the plant of Terra Vesa. We have a motion to approve. I'll move to approve. Moved by Kim. Do we have a second? Second by Don. So we have entered into similar agreements in the past. There's been a, a change or different financing, and the bank is kind of tasking the city with, with overseeing this to make sure things aren't going off the rails. Um, the one that we have right now, um, previous agreements similar, I'm not aware of us having to take any action or spending a, any additional time. Are you, are you, Tim? I know you haven't. It's kind of an unfair question to ask you, given you know short time here. Um, not aware. Okay. So, any any other questions on this? Like I say, we have one of these. I think it is in Terra Vesa already. And uh, yeah, I believe that the first in. Second editions yeah. where it was handled yeah. the, the same way. It has a local, I believe it's a local bank here too. One, one community bank. Okay. Kim? I believe those same requirements were in the other ones too. It's that the city has to notify the bank that there's a default from the developer's obligations. And I think, I think it's just part of the city's inspection process as they go through um, before they accept things or as things are going along if there's a problem there would be things that they would note it isn't like you said no additional work really then what it would be normally the city would do that and then they would tell the developer that this is wrong the only thing you, this is doing is requiring the city in addition to telling the developer you also tell the bank so that the bank can have the opportunity to make the repairs if the developer isn't going to and then take it over Example might be, you know, the road has to get paved and, and curb and gutter, you know, and they walk away and <laughs> left as, as gravel. This, you know, Tim, I, I'll put this back to you, you know, this, you and your department, you know, we're, we're tasking you with this, assuming this responsibility, you know, and you're comfortable with it, I believe. Yes. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. See, now we'll call the vote. Favor of resolution R-146-23, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, next on to the big one here. We have resolution R-129-23, adopting the 2024 through 2033 capital improvement plan. Do we have a motion to approve? I'll move approval. Moved by Jetser. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Don. Um, Mr. Haith, would you like to come up and speak? Good evening. Um, I sent out an email earlier, and I would appreciate if you would take a look at it. I spent a fair bit of time looking for a solution to Chair Earp's question about how you decide what priorities go on different kinds of SIP projects in particular, how it's flooding compared to um, requirements in the MS4. So I, I poked around, and I, as I say in the email, you know, in the BS world, we call it standing on the shoulders of giants. 
and I looked at different uh, stormwater management plans that other municipalities put together in the town of <clears throat> Chapel Hill in North Carolina has got a great one and it could be easily adapted for here just take out the stuff about what they're going to do in terms of specifics and leave the process about how they evaluate which kinds of flooding under what circumstances who shares the costs how does that compare to things that happen in, in the MS4 how do you develop and keep stormwater personnel. It's a great document. It could be easily adapted with relatively little work and adopted and put into place and provide framework that's been missing since uh, Mr. Woodard and Mr. Otherson left. I mean, I, I, Chairman Erbst has talked about in the past how Fitchburg has been the leader in regard to stormwater, and I absolutely agree. In fact, I've studied the old documents and all the things were put in were groundbreaking, the system that was put in, and the second phase came in in, I think, the late 90s. And I say that the issues at Seminole Glen probably would have been avoided if Seminole Glen would have got put on that list of things <coughs> that were the things to be redone in the late 90s. Um, but when Mr. Woodard, who was you know one of those people that is, embodies trust, embodies stewardship, Everything's done right. When he walked out the door, and then after that, Mr. Eilertson walked out the door, they took more than their knowledge, they took the process, right? All the stuff that happens behind the scenes, they took with them. And the question is how to get that back. That's a tough question, right? Chairman Erb's question about how you make that trade-off, that's a darn tough question. And the Chapel Hill document is a possible solution. Um, what I want to talk about is the uh, Duns Marsh flooding issue. So first of all, I think it's, I haven't seen a final report. Um, and so I think it's premature to put it in the budget. Um, my understanding from watching the first video is that it was a 275 year event. I happen to be driving through it actually. Um, and so the question is, is what's the decision criteria? So it's a 275 year event. And yes, the pictures look bad. And I can attest to it because I was driving down Monroe at the time it happened. I'll send you some pictures at some point. But what is the standard? It's a 275 year event. How do we evaluate what that is? And the other issue is, you know, so if it's a 100 year event, sure, right? Then we have a standard. But now the question is, where's that boundary? The fact that it flooded is significant or not. How many other properties in Fitchburg would flood in a 275 year event? I'll bet a whole lot. Yeah. Right? And so the question is, is that the best use of dollars from that perspective? I think that's a good, that's a question that needs to be asked. The other issue is this issue of simulation. So computer simulation of things that are similar to stormwater is something that I've spent most of my career doing. Computer networks are storing forward, you know, packets come in, that's the way that Computer simulation works for um, stormwater. It's a packet of water comes in. That's how they do it. It goes down the stream. That's a network. I started out as an industrial engineer, production scheduling, inventory, et cetera. And the, the trite comment in modeling is all models are wrong. Some are useful. And in this case, there's no calibration data. Right? There's nothing on the ground to tie the results of the model, the predictive results of the model with the actual operation of the watershed. And so that means that there's no absent whole set of processes that I'm not aware exist. There's no way to scientifically or from a principled perspective characterize the uncertainty of the model. Is it plus or minus 5%? Is it plus or minus 50%? It's really difficult to say if you don't have a tying to the ground. And so one of the things I think that is that issue here is the whole notion of the lack of technology with regard to the use in the stormwater utility. Technology is getting really cheap. You can instrument things like pond levels for a few thousand dollars. You can even instrument things like float levels. I put together a paper about instrumenting Seminole Glen by just putting poles in the ground and taking trail cams that have cell phone capability, taking pictures every 15 minutes. Send them off. For a thousand bucks, you can instrument the watershed. And so my point here is that 
wouldn't it be better, this is not an inexpensive project. At the very least, it would be good to have the discussion about is it possible to instrument the watershed to at least even at low flow levels, see how close it is before committing to an enormous investment. And then second is what's the actual standard and who's making the decision about where the standard of safety is? Is it a 100 year event or is it not? And without seeing the models, and as far as I know, the last PIM hasn't occurred, I could be wrong. It's an issue of putting it into the, the SIP because once it's in, it's gonna get done. Um, and so what I would suggest is leave it in as a plate, take the actual project description out, leave the amount in as a placeholder, and then when the data comes back and the results from the public meeting come, have a discussion about, at that point, the issues that I've raised and to decide whether or not that's the best use of the dollars. It, it, it's in the enterprise fund. It can't be spent for anything else unless you say so. The issue is you haven't been saying so, and so other people have been going in and poaching things, right? So, Tim, a third of his salary is paid by the stormwater utility, and the same thing is true of Tracy. That's, I've looked at, I'm not a, a DPW guy, but I've looked at 100 different DPWs. Doesn't happen. In fact, back in 1913, when they put in the utility commissions, it says, and it's still in the law, that the utility commission shall have the call of the services of the city engineer. And so we've got Ben was a half time and Ryan was a half time and they were getting between the, the director and the deputy director that cost as much as two half time stormwater engineers, two half time stormwater engineers. Really, we've got to do better than that. There's a lot more work out there. There's a lot more care that needs to be taken care of our watersheds. And if you don't assert the power of the stormwater utility executive authority, which you have, it's going to continue, people are going to continue to go in, suck it out, and use it for other things. That's the way it goes. So anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you. I, just, I was just uh, I was coming back. You know, I, I've been at a couple of meetings on that on that project. You know, and, I've only seen one. So yeah, uh, and uh, you know the the level the level is that is absolutely known from photographs and. Uh, Elevation of the pond, and uh, the bigger driver on that one, Mr. Heath, is uh, you know was starting to get into those departments. You know, it was going to it was going to cause. There were two things that I saw. It was going to cause a, they incurred some damage, some water damage on the apartments. But then we also had uh, damage to our facility, our stormwater facilities. You know, from erosion and a large amount. Um, I. I, I have no doubt about the project's project's need. You know, whether it was a two seventy five or a five hundred year or two hundred. You know, I, I get I get confused. I just thought it was a hell of a lot of water coming down that day, and I had it in my neighbor my neighborhood too. My intersection was flooded, and and uh, so, but thank thank you thank you for again for your thoughtful comments on this. I will I will spend some time looking at that Chapel Valley ordinance myself. Thank really appreciate your. Uh, you know your input on these things and your your uh, your suggestions to us. All right. So um, back to the board. Uh, so here to approve the capital improvement plan. Um, like I say the majority. I like our board to focus on the um, things that you know public public facility you know, public works things, not not fire trucks, not you know the, you know things that. Uh, you know, streets, streets, water, sewers, stormwater, uh, those projects is what I, I normally, you know, the, our board, I think, normally approves those portions of it, you know, but we certainly can approve the whole whole thing. So I, I'll open it up now for, for questions. Um, you know, I've heard the presentations from the, uh, um, the department heads, you know, a couple times on, on the main things, and I guess maybe I'll start with Tim. Do you have any anything you'd like to say about the CIP? Uh, 
No. <laughs> um, if you guys have any questions for me specifically on, on projects, I can answer it. I'll just I'll just add one thing, and I'll let you guys jump in. There was I made amendments to the CIP, and I made one amendment to remove a project to uh, to create a walkway around Duns Marsh, and uh, where it's next to Seminole Highway, it's a swamp there, and there's brush and. Across, across Seminole Highway, and we got a great walkway there. You can still see the marsh, and you're not, um, um, you know, it's not an area where, where you, we'd put a walkway next to Seminole there when the snow plows came, then it would fill it up with snow, and it's in, you know, it's in a swamp there. I just, I felt that was uh, a waste of money when you can, you know, you just cross the street and you have a, Parallel walkway, and you come back, and you can circle the, the marsh. I, I didn't, I didn't feel spending. They had a, a quarter of a million in there. I didn't think that would be enough by the time you do all your mitigation going through a, going through a swamp. But uh, I'll, I'll open up the board for, for questions or comments. Well, I, like you, concentrated on all of the Board of Public Works aspects of this and didn't spend any time looking at the other departments and whatever, figuring there were other committees that were, it was important to, to them. I see there were three amendments. One was yours to remove the project and two were uh, bills for traffic calming um, kinds of devices. but. Um, I guess I looked through all of the, the projects and of course I don't know details about, you know, a lot of it is replacement funds. You're putting in so much money a year so that when something happens, you have a replacement fund that you can use. And to me, that seems like a good, a good way to do it because you, otherwise you're always in an emergency mode where something goes wrong and you need to do it. Uh, you need to do some changes and you don't have the budget and the items to do it. So by having replacement funds, um, I think that that's a, a good way. But, I, you know, I think it's been, you have to, to some extent, I guess, trust your Board of Public Works department. And I know there have been a lot of changes in the Board of Public Works at the city of Fitchburg level over the last three or four years. So there have been some differing thoughts on what is more important and what is not. But... Um, I guess, in my opinion, I believe that I've looked through the projects and I didn't see anything. I, I guess I tend to agree with you, Dave, on that the Duns Marsh path. I do think I don't really think that that's necessary because I do think, with the lanes on Seminole Highway and with the walkway on the other side, um, there is adequate places to view that, and I, I don't see that that's an important aspect. Um, for the money portion of it right now. But I guess in my review of all of the things, I didn't see anything that I thought was um, out of the ordinary. I did concentrate a lot on what was happening in the next two years, sometimes out to three, because it seems like the further out stuff, you put things in, yes, we're interested in doing that. You know, there's been a lot of amendments in the years. We're moving things from year to year, it, up or back, depending on if things last longer than what you think or if they deteriorate quicker than what you think. So I concentrated on the expenditures for 2024 and 2025 mostly in my review. And I, I went through all the projects, read all the descriptions, and um, did all that. And I didn't, I didn't feel that there was anything that I thought I would bring up as questionable that I didn't think we should be doing in those next two years, um, trusting a lot of the department's judgment as to what is the conditions of things. I mean, I didn't go out and drive every single road. I know Irish Lane is in bad shape, and um, the, the places, some other places need additional bike paths um, to accommodate some of that. So I, in general, I think I am supportive of the, the Board of Public Works Department, or the Public Works Department of aspects of things in the capital improvement plan. 
Thank you, Kim. Uh, you mentioned the replacement. You know, that was something, a budget change we made a number of years ago, you know, that we, we set aside money for the replacement of, you know, a plow truck's going to last this long or whatever, that we're, we're budgeting for that, which I, I, that was a very, you know, a, a very good move on our, on our part. Anyone else? Um, I looked at it again. It's got a lot of detail that I don't know that I have to trust him and his group. They have it. The biggest concern I can see, and I don't know it's in the budget, but you'll have to tell me, is we pick, we're picking up a lot of lane miles here over the years. And we got new developments, and we're picking up a lot of lane miles there. Is the basic safety elements of that being caught up in this program? By that I mean just payment marking is key safety elements. If, if you can't keep up with it, with the current budget, with all these increasing lane miles and a couple years from now, it's going to get that much more. Uh, that would be my only concern in the overall. And then I, I do have some other specific on your uh, uh, the proposals for the, the traffic coming. But I'll let you first answer the first one. Yeah, obviously that is always a concern is you know, taking on additional lane miles and only having so much available budget to, to address that stuff. So that's something we'll look at closely as this stuff comes online. If we need to budget more, obviously make the recommendation to, to keep up with that. Um, also with, you know, not just the striping, but the rehabilitation and resurfacing of the roads. Is it, you know, what the city's putting towards every year sufficient to also take on that additional lane mile. So that's something we'll closely monitor um, as, as this stuff comes online to, to make sure we're keeping up with that. And I do agree with your proposal for the marsh. I would take that money though and put it into a signalized crossing or a ped crossing somewhere along on Seminole because yeah, that, that you don't have the ability it's to a good, get it's a good there. it's a good point yeah, the yeah. one light one the one crossing is signalized the other is is not uh, yeah, probably I missed that but, but people don't know how to react to that especially when if they're traveling on Seminole Highway and they just see one that is signalized and then they get to the next one it's like am I supposed to stop am I not supposed to stop are the people there gonna go are they resting because they're in the middle it, it it's sort of confusing yeah. and and so Traffic calming with it. I like proposals. I, I didn't know what your overall game plan for all your tools and your toolkit, but the ones you have in here, especially speed boards, it's got to be synced up with law enforcement's funding as well because to really get behavioral changes, you're going to need some occasional enforcement there to reinforce that, um, what your speed boards are doing. Otherwise, all you're and is just telling them how fast they're going. That's that's a good point. You know, I've I've and I've had this discussion with the chief many times, and what the chief tells me is, Dave, what you do, what you have to do to keep the speed down on the road, so you don't have to rely on me to do it. And, and I said I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. You know, speed bumps that slow down. And the case in point is, you know, on my street, we put them in a number of years ago, and it made all the difference. Now, you get down the street, I'm trying to get the neighbors to fill out their petition in front of our park. They're speeding there. Well, two speed bumps would, would cure that. So um, I, I mean to get us off track here. Were you talking about the speed boards, the sign that tells you how fast you're going? Okay, not the humps in the road. They, they, no. they, uh, again, it's part of your overall strategy. I don't know yeah. all the tools yeah. are that he has that he's approaching. Particular ones here, it's, he's trying to do a roadside diet based on painting, and then I saw a bunch of stuff in there about getting some speed boards out. Again, unless you sync that up with some enforcement, I would take the money then if you don't have the enforcement and just start plopping more of the, the humps up there or bump outs at yeah. I can't control human. I can't control human behavior. Yeah. Well, the. You know, the, the best way to control human behavior is through the physical design of the road. That's, we're in agreement, yeah. But so, Bill, your proposal on like Osmondson, where it's a really wide street, um, you know, striping so that there's bike lanes and that, you know, they, they spent all that money. They did that on Richardson. 
how many? Four or five years ago? Six years ago? Maybe I'm showing my it was, it was, COVID thing. It was much longer ago than oh. that. But, and, but then they, and it didn't work. It, and they well, they resurfaced the it like two years later or something. It was. But they didn't put it back. The people right. there didn't want it to be that way or whatever. I don't know what the complaint was, but they didn't put it back. So if it, in Richardson and Osmondson are parallel streets that basically serve, you know, sort of the same areas because you could go down either to get yep. to any of those side streets. And they put a lot of time and effort and money into those on Richardson Street and put parking lanes in and put, you know, I don't, you, you talked about two drive lanes. Um, I'm assuming you meant one in each direction and not two, you know, down in the same direction. But it was just like, it was such a waste. On Richardson and and maybe looking into why that didn't work and what was the problem with it before we end up doing the same thing on Osmondson and running into the same problems yeah I, I'm sure that's that's information that our traffic engineer does not have yeah yeah that, that, I, I didn't re, I didn't recall that either Kim Don probably wasn't here at that point in time when Richardson had that. Were you? I, yeah, I've been. I, I live on Richardson okay. Street, and and I remember when they put the uh, when they striped. I mean, I don't remember what year it was, but it was quite a long time ago, and I was just very confused as to why they would stripe the street and then resurface it almost immediately, and then you know that that resurfacing is now disintegrating, and so the the lines are coming back, <laughs> and it's. It's confusing. You can see drivers like suddenly shifting when they see that. Oh, holy cow! There's there's some lines here that I'm supposed to be driving in because the you know the yellow line is not down the center of the roadway. <laughs> yeah. I, I would add there you know, was a project uh, we did many years ago, and it's on Lacey Road you know, from Fish Hatchery going that way. And we why we beat that to death. You know how we how wide we were going to do it, how the lanes would be, where there'd be parking. And oh, people came in and were swearing at us. You don't know what the heck you're doing. I tell you what, it controls the speed. You know, the grand, grand there's not. I'm not saying they're not speeding on Lacey from uh, um, from the fire station down, but it 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 controls the the speed. It narrows it, and and uh, you know, people pay attention. So, I, uh, again, I'm not. I want to weigh in. I'm not a traffic engineer, so I don't, I'm not my realm. I think quite a few people use the parking on Lacey Road, which helps just to have it striped and if nobody parks there, whereas I, and because a lot of those people have some not very long driveways and, you know, it's hard to get in and out, that kind of thing. And I think part of the problem on Richardson is when they did stripe it as, you know, well, bike lanes and then parking lanes, nobody ever parked there, so people didn't get the feeling that it was a smaller road because definitely in decreasing uh, the lane widths and those both of those streets are was it Osmondson and what was the other one you had on there? Pembroke. Oh yeah, Pembroke. They're both very wide. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you know that it, it it encourages people to go faster. So there's you know. Any any other questions? You know, we put this is the guiding document kind of for outside of a comprehensive plan. You know, it's the guiding document for. Uh, investments our city is making their both investments and, and maintenance and um, we spend a lot of time apartment heads it gets you know it's kind of like what's the term about politics it's like making sausage you don't want to see what see how it's done but hopefully you get a good you get a good result I you know, I, 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 I had a question on you know the, the the land that we have taken over the area we've taken over from the town of Madison that has now become the city of Fitchburg so I know we knew a long time in advance that this was going to happen, but did this, this is the first year where we're approving the capital improvement plan where that is in the city of Fitchburg. So is the, any of the projects and the things that we were planning to do there, I mean, some of it was not in the greatest of shape that we took over to begin with, and it's now our responsibility to do some of the maintenance. Is there an offset from some of the, 
you know, what we're anticipating getting from the, the taxes and from that area compared to what the level of project is or the level of, of maintenance and things we need to do? Or has that sort of been an offset? Is there a lot more maintenance than what it is? So that is affecting somewhat on the budget. Do you have any idea on that, Tim? Yeah, so actually 2023 would be the first full year. So last year's budget would have incorporated, you know, the additional streets and parks that the, the city took over from the, the city of, um, or the town of Madison. Um, so there is an impact with that. Uh, I don't know specifically what they changed from, I guess it would be 2022 to 2023. If, services got impacted you know within the city of Fitchburg f for the areas that got added from the town of Madison so I, I wasn't a part of that last year you know, I like there's a new you know there's a new park we're gonna redo a park down there and I just give you a general general sense of it though cameo you know, what we were getting in, in tax revenue, you know, for that is far less than the, the needs it's going to take to, to upgrade and maintain it. You know, and we knew that going in, and and previous you know previous councils fell down by not setting aside money for that. And so, you know, we're we have to have safe streets. You know, we're not going to do everything to bring them up to our standards in one year, but. What we're getting in, in tax revenue is, is not is not covering our, you know, it's just, I, I can't do anything about that. You know, the additional employees we need and, and things like that, we will, we will it'll take a little time is what I'm, what I'm saying. You know, we're not going to bite off, bite off the whole thing at once. You know. Anything else on this? Uh -oh. Go ahead, Don. Just my own personal engineer thoughts, uh, again, on the, uh, roadside diet and if you're gonna try to do it with marking some communities have put the parking next to the live lanes and the bike lanes along the curb so and that will introduce slower traffic because parked cars are closer to your driving lane I'm glad you said that um, I wasn't brave enough to explicitly state that in the amendment but um, yeah that that was a thought that I had had as well and you know if somebody says well no I don't want to park there somebody might run into it and you say aha uh -huh. <laughs> <Go to it. laughs> now you see what the bikers and the walkers so, feel like so, so Don you live down in that area do you think if there's parking lanes that they would be used I mean is there a, a quite a bit of on-street parking needed or are the do people mostly have room in their driveways because again if you put that parking lane right up next to the travel lane and nobody ever parks there, it, it's not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, not so much on Osmonds and Pembroke. There's quite a bit. Vehicles parked down there. So is the amendment written so that it would allow some research to be done as to which is the best way to do it and if it would be used, if that would be effective? Yeah, what, what I had essentially said was um, stripe some bike lanes on there. And then, you know, I, I sent that to Misty Dodge, who then forwarded the request over to the Board of Public Works, who said, yeah, so, you know, maybe we'll do this. Yep. And this is what it would cost. So, uh, you know, right now it's basically just a dollar amount. Okay. And I assume the details can be hashed out any number of ways when the time comes. You are correct. Anything else? Um, yes, just, I didn't see it in there, and we we talked about the LEDs before, but I didn't see it in here. Is there a game plan to convert the rest? At, at this time, no. I, was, I didn't think so. Yeah. So we, we were just opportunistically taking advantage of the available grant money? I, yeah. You know, I want, maybe next year it might be something I propose or talk to him. You know, I, if we had to pay the whole thing ourselves, you know, I, I, I think there is a, there is a payback on it. There's a payback. Um, yeah, you have you know, to look I'd, at the I'd cost like, benefit. I'd like, to, I'd like to calculate the payback cost benefit uh, before we decide to do it, do it all ourselves, but I, 
I certainly, I don't think I'd be opposed to it. And that payback is not just in electricity costs. I'm assuming the LEDs are substantially less maintenance than the mercury and sodium vapors. Is that correct, Tim? Correct. Yeah, I don't think you need starters on those. Probably just a photocell to tell them when to come on. But you know, the other ones with that, that kind of starter on there, that seemed to always be going bad. Any other Any other comments? Thank you. Then, all in favor of the uh, approving the uh, CIP signify of 2024. With, with the amendments, or uh, are, are we approving no, the the, the we're not, mayor's we're not, CIP, we're not, or we're not addressing the amendments at not, all? We're not addressing the amendments. That's uh, going to be for council to do. I okay. So we're just sort of expressing our opinions, and when you do your report at council, you could say we discussed it and. This was the general consensus, or yeah, right. not even. I don't. I don't. I don't ever recall Tim approving. Does? I don't ever recall approving the amendments at at this at, okay. by this board. Uh, I could be wrong. You know, I've been wrong many times before. We have. We have. We have. We have had good discussion on the amendments, though. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, all in favor of the uh, CIP twenty uh, twenty three. 2023 through uh, 2024 through 2033 signify by saying aye. And, and it, let me just ask one question. We're just talking about the public works department. We are just talking the public and works. And not the rest of that. That is confirmed, okay. yeah, the right. public works portions. Uh, um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Public works portion is approved. Uh, next, our next meeting is... Uh, July 27th. 27th? August 7th. August 7th, okay. Sounds good. If you're not going to be here, let me let me know. I should be back from the rag by. Hopefully I'm back from the rag by. But then. Um, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Well, by Kim, do we have a second? Second. Second by Don. All in favor of adjournment, signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned at 7-11. <laughs>